about me. Uh, so thanks a lot for having me, uh, us. I'm presenting this together with Robin in absentia. He couldn't make it always in Sweden at the moment. Um, but we are sort of slightly peripheral, as I guess everyone is. Uh, but we're from the management schools, so business management. So we, we deal with quite um, straightforward questions of strategy, corporate organizational strategy, organizational form, control. Um, and much of this is, is geared around riffing off a variety of disciplines on the outside. Typically economics, quite a lot of psychology, a little bit of anthropology, a little bit of philosophy. And so we're, we're I think, in a very small group intrigued by how questions how things hang together and so on. This, the, the route into uh, Spencer Brown has been through Bateson for both of us and uh, quite animated by the kind of questions Bateson poses also in terms of uh, sustainability but also survival, persistence of form, of, of something that maintains itself in its context as opposed to against its context. And therefore, the question of inside and outside is quite germane to the, the kind of concerns that we have, even though typically it's not articulated in this way. So what we try to do here is uh, not start with... Oh, <laughs> wrong one. Here we go. Not start with uh, the laws, but start with lion's teeth. Um, I guess everyone's more or less familiar, but it's a collection of wonderful stories, short stories, um, covering a variety of themes. We did something, I did something a while back on The Little Spider. Um, but here, focused on, or we focused on, on something called The Garden and the Cliff, which is a very short story about a village, and it's depicted here, at least loosely. A village perched on the edge of a cliff, and it's a beautifully contained village with families, with sip, uh, children that are wonderfully paired up, with pets that are paired up. And they all live at this cliff with the garden extending to the edge of the cliff. Not quite visible here, but almost. And they all live there very happily uh, because the distinction is perfect. Everyone knows the cliff is dangerous and they do so because an old man had written all the laws of the, of the village and he had decreed that one side is, uh, bestows a blessing, the other side bestows a curse. And so everyone's safe because it's an absolute and perfect distinction. The adults, of course, understand it. The children already get it. Even the pets have somehow, he claims, memorized from their previous lives that kind of fault line, the perfection. Lo and behold, the old man dies, uh, and a team of experts <laughs> come and remake that perfect distinction. And they say, well, we should have a process, a legal process, by which people can be persecuted or prosecuted for the fault they're doing. So if a sane person crosses the line, they're in a different position to a, a less sane person or a child and so on. And lo and behold, they change it. And what happens is that loads of people fall off the cliff. Rich people, because they say, yeah, I can afford a lawyer. Yeah, I can fight the law. Um, children, because hey, I am innocent. The insane, as he calls them, because what can they do? We can interpret, interpret anything as we want. And animals, because they don't speak the language. So... He ends up with this wonderful, oh, one, one insane person falls off the cliff and becomes sane. That's it, that's loads of little mm -hmm. wonderful uh, side <laughs> that roads into it. But he ends up with this, this claim that, well, they all lived unhappily ever after. And so this, this is where I want to take, or we want to take uh, our leave, because it is a question of separation. There's so many obvious connotations about distinction, about the inside, about the outside, about how the outside works on the inside. And we want to take it into two, two lines of flight, which have to do with the kind of questions that are pertinent to, to our work, organizing, strategizing, looking at control, and so on. And, and in particular, I want to take this up in terms of uh, what is called political economy, the question of sovereignty, control, but also the question of territory, and uh, how a, a, a state, a political body, can somehow corral its insight into order and make it work against the outside, which is perhaps therefore inherently disordered. And I want to start, so it's not a, 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 a direct way of applying Spencer Brown, but I think there are two ways of thinking that may be somewhat generative. One is to look at the kind of problems that emerge in political economy, in the kind of ways in which um, statescraft, the body politic is configured, and what Spencer Brown's way of thinking can help here in terms of a remedy or at least a way of talking about the kind of paradoxes. 
And the second is perhaps to look at uh, more productively how else we can think about this play between the absolute and the man-made. So between laws that are eternal, that are somehow decreed by divine providence, by habit, or by a, uh, some sort of mythological ground, and by things that are done by experts, by dictators, or otherwise that are imposed and somehow riff off or riff against or stand against these more formal ones. Okay, so a starting point to, to work with uh, Spencer Brown's uh, village is the Bible, I guess. This is a very early form of distinction inside and the outside. We've got paradise, we've got Eden, um, which, which is perfectly innocent and perfectly structured. It's entirely contained, but in it, it already contains also a seed of its own destruction. So there is, with the, the tree and the apple and the fruit of knowledge, the potential for the, for the upsetting of the order that is somehow bestowed through a divine uh, kind of intervention. There is, there's quite a lot we could, I guess, read into Spencer Brown's little story here. Also the idea of, of knowledge, you know, knowing what's on the other side, knowing that the limit is not absolute, but investigated limit itself. And we even see that the story structure is almost like an arche. You know, you've got pairs of pets, you've got pairs of children, which there's a prototypicality to the kind of community he portrays. So th that's one way of looking, which I guess uh, it's somewhat simple and perhaps a bit primitive. Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch, by the way, here. Um, another one which is much more veering into political economy as such is, is Thomas Hobbes, 16th century uh, writer. Most famous uh, is the Leviathan, which is a, uh, a figure of the body politic, which is based on a social contract. So we here see the sovereign, the sword and crosier, overlooking the land, and it's it literally made of embodied, yeah, incorporated through the subjects who come together and find a wonderful order and therefore of also power and prowess and therefore form the, the outline of the state and bestow through the contract the sovereign the power over the land. So, so there is a distinction between the inside and the outside because the sovereign acts on behest of the people and creates an order <coughs> <clears throat> Whereas the outside world is a world that Hobbes called full of worry and strife. It's a bleak world. It's disastrous. And only if we corral ourselves into a state form in which we abdicate our personal rights in order to be preserved in and through the power of a sovereign can have order prevail over the disorder on the outside. So, so there's, there's, this theme is, is coming through about distinctions entirely in this political process. If we move on a little bit from Hobbes, uh, we come to, and this is a highly contentious choice, I must admit, but a guy called Carl Schmidt, um, who's, he has a real renaissance recently, uh, but, but also quite a, a nasty connotation because he was a legal scholar in the National Socialist period, but he has written quite profusely, it's been picked up uh, at the moment uh, by a number of people, about the the way the modern nation state differs from the older uh, states that were based on uh, sovereigns in, in the Hobbesian time, even though Hobbes was at the, the cusp of all this already. And for him, the, the nation state is based on territory and on something specific, specific called landname, it's a taking of land. And it derives the word law, which is nomos, from nomain, which is a Greek root, which is both a division but also a pasturing. So you divide and you cultivate. And he's quite radical in this, and, and there's loads of nasty colonial justifications that can be read into his work about higher, higher cultured country, uh, states taking away territory from lower cultured ones, as it has as been in interpreted. But in principle, what is quite intriguing as a descriptive element is this, this idea that it starts with division and then a propagation. So, what happens then in the shift from the ancient territories to the new ones is a shift also from a, a broad sense of uh, what he calls, what he calls, what he calls, uh, hold on, <laughs> there's a, I can't remember the English translation, it's, it, there's a, a sense of the outside being important, a Großraum, a, a, a great room, towards something that's entirely specific territorial inward looking. And the difference, he says, is because 
with the circumnavigation of the globe, with the sense that the outside world is certainly structured, states look on the inside to structure themselves too. And he makes a play with, between two terms, Ortung and Ordnung. Ortung is a location, and th by virtue of location comes order. And that's very different to the Hobbesian term. It's a very inward-looking, terrestrially defined, boundary-based understanding of the state. Now he makes a couple of other really interesting points. We come back to one in a second. But one is quite intriguing is that he's, he claims that the power of the sovereign is not the power to make the law. It's not the power to draw the distinction, but it's the power to make an exception from the distinction. So it's a power to redraw the line. That is where the pure, the sovereign is he, of course, who makes a distinction. So, so the, this is, in a way, a, a really rough shot kind of run through a number of key political economy theories, all based in a funny way about inclusion, exclusion, the question who draws the distinction, and who has the capacity to draw and redraw them. So it's very germane to the discussion we're having. In this, a number of paradoxes emerge, more or less acknowledged, written in loads of different ways. So, so a way of summarising them is as follows. One is that in the Hobbesian sense, this inclusion or containment of the war and strife, of the violence into the body politic, comes in two ways. It is a containment. Violence is contained. It's dampened down. But it's also contained. So it's also brought into the body politic as a festering wound that continually can erupt and, and transform the order that is made. Just like the apple in paradise is a continuous reminder of the other and the capacity for disorder. So containment within itself also coherently breeds disorder. And so Hannah Arendt, in a discussion of um, totalitarian systems, says the tyrant, who is the, the, is the, the kind of exemplification of the sovereign, develops the or tyranny, develops the germs of its own destruction. Now it's, it spawns brooding grievances that can be pulled into resentful, strong subject bodies and can, they can upset the order. So, so any order that's, that's based on a containment <coughs> and on a violence is therefore brittle, needs continuous adaptation. That's one of the kind of paradoxes. The more ordered, the more brittle. Another one is, is I just mentioned, this idea that sovereign is he who decides on a state of exception. That is in itself a paradox, because any, any body that is based upon a, a, a distinction and it has the capacity to write its own distinction is sort of a, a fickle, curious, idling <coughs> figure in and of itself. And then there are numerous more, but two that are quite intriguing. One is the figure of the band, a person banned from a city. is does, uh, does so by exclusion, by virtue of an inclusion. Now they're expelled from a city and therefore no longer part of it, they're banned from it, but they're still somehow subject to the law of the city. So the outside and the inside are curiously connected. It's quite difficult to reconcile. There's a wonderful book by George Agamben called Homo Saka, who follows the, a, a Latin figure in, Ro uh, figure in Roman law. The other one that's really interesting is the stateless, the refugee, perhaps. And there's a reversal here. What we have here is the inclusion by virtue of an exclusion. So again, it's a figure... Uh, and uh, Arendt says, yeah, although everyone seems to agree that the plight of these people consists precisely in their loss of the rights to man, no one seems to know which rights they lost when they lost these human rights. So, so it's a, again, it's a figure that, that is, you know, that the labor of the migrant camp would be the example. They're in a country, they're subject to the laws, but can't make themselves, can't make use of the law. So it's a curious in-between state. So these political economy ideas continually have transgressions that I think, or we think in the language of Spencer Brown, make a lot of sense, but in a, as a political issue are massive problems. I'd like to continue with this notion of the homeless for a bit. The, uh, the homeless, uh, that, that's a stretch, it's a, a way that uh, Martin Heidegger talks about it, or the, the un-at-home. Now, by un-at-home it means not having a state, not having an affiliation. Uh, and Arendt says, yeah, the plight is not that they are not equal before the law, but no law exists for them. Not they're oppressed, but as nobody wants to even oppress them. So it's a, it's a curious problem, and something we see on TVs and news all the time, this, this being on the outside without having the capacity to come back into the inside. And what she says, and here are these, these interesting links 
with um, um, with Schmidt, it's as something profoundly has changed over the last centuries, which is that the unprecedented thing is not just the loss of home, but the impossibility of finding a new home, which means but that the outside is no longer an open space, but it's everything is cartographed, uh, it is is mapped, everything is on is uh, already filled with people, with territories, so there is, the world is no longer something that in itself holds itself open, but then creates these curious figures who in the past could have found a diaspora or could have been assigned diaspora, but we see the, the impossibility of these curious moments. So I want to... Yeah, and this is this link uh, between Karl Schmidt, Ortung and Ordnung, the emergence of a new spatial political order in which... Um, the state no, configures itself in light of the outside world, which is now purely ordered also as an inside ordering. With this comes also reversal of the power of the sovereign, of course. Yeah? No longer is this ultimate figure, but behold the economic, political and other influences. So there's a kind of a loosening of the order. And then um, Arendt's sense that, you know, that the... Uh, the incapacity to have a space on the outside that creates these entirely new ways of the inside being unable to accommodate people from the outside. So it's this constant figure. This is Sputnik, by the way, which was launched just before Anna Arendt wrote uh, The Human Condition, and which she refers to the beginning as man catapulting himself into the heaven and losing, losing ground. So there's, there's something bizarre going on. Um, and to bring it back to this beginning story, before we move on, the, the play between, between inside outside, between who draws the line, whether laws are new and old, is, is something that is entirely scripted in the discourse of political economy. That's where I want to go. And, and Spencer Brown so far has allowed us, I think, or would allow us, if we drew it, to make sense of these distinctions of redrawing, of exceptions, of cancellations, of re-entries. All this is a language that would help a lot with the kind of paradoxes. But I think there's something else. We think there's something else. And there's something more generative, perhaps, to think about democracy in and of itself. And for this, I want to replay the story, but this time said slightly differently, as, as Antigone, Sophocles' play. So <laughs> Antigone is it's, it's, it's one of the most well-known stories in Western civilization. Um, as two brothers, uh, it's set in Thebes. Got an uncle called Creon, and they all vie for, or the brothers and the uncle vie for uh, dominance over Thebes, the, the city. One brother leaves the city and attacks it. Both brothers kill each other in the process. And Creon, the uncle, buries one, but not the attacking brother. And he lets him lay in the street to rot and be eaten by the birds and the dogs. So Creon, at this point, was appointed dictator of Thebes. And he made that decision. He drew and made a new law that this person, despite all the old laws and requirements, this person shall not be buried. Antigone revolts, uh, buries him nonetheless. Antigone is betrothed to Creon's son, uh, Haemon, who also protests. There's all sorts going on. In the end, almost everyone's dead, um, as these tragedies are. Creon loses his son, he loses his daughter-in-law, he loses his wife, and, and it's, a, it's pretty much a disaster. What is quite intriguing is the story itself is a, a mirror play, I think, of this Spencer Brown idea of the old law and the new. Who's got the capacity to make laws? What happens if the old and the new collide? But the story itself is also interesting because it's written by Sophocles, who's an Athenian, and he worked in the Athenian city-state as an administrator. And he wrote this play to show the people as well the dominance over Athenian-type democracy over Thebes' kind of... Uh, tyranny and dictatorship, yeah, the savageness of the other city. And so what we have here is uh, the possibility for another way of thinking about democracy, which lies underlies the whole play and underlies the duality of the old mythological laws as well as the man-made laws, which is a different way of thinking about democracy. We come back to this unat-homeness, and here, here I want to riff off a little bit, in particular Heidegger's work, uh, as it goes into our end. The, this notion of the uncanny, the un at home, as ungeheure, the, the, the dangerous uh, and, and, and that which is spooky to a degree, but to be un at home. Um, 
Heidelin plays with the Hölderlin uh, translation of the uh, poem of, of called the Ister, the Danube River. And Hölderlin says beautifully, the manifold is the uncanny, but nothing more uncanny than man loomingly stirs. That's poor translation, but it's sort of, it's really difficult. So, so this uncanny is a real problem. The honored homeless is a problem in typical political ecology, economy. But what, what we find here in a different way of thinking about democracies is the acknowledgement that the uncanny is the home of being, that we are in the world in a way that is not settled, but that is on at home. So the uncanny is the immense and was what has never yet been. The uncanny is also not what has never yet been present. It is what comes into presence always already and advance prior to all uncanniness. The uncanny as the being that shines into everything ordinary, into entities, and that it's shining often graces entities like the shadow of a cloud silently passing. There's nothing in common with the monstrous. And she goes on and on, Heidegger, trying to find language for the inexpressible. The uncanny is a being in a world without having sense or sight or language for that world. It is being at home in a place that's hostile to being. Or at least that doesn't accommodate being easily. So there's something curiously unsettling about it. But what Heidegger seems to push us towards is the acknowledgement that this is actually what we should face up to. That we should not expect the world to be ordered, but that the disorder, the, the incapacity to, lang to form language, to access it, is the way into being truly human. I'm almost done. And the way this, this happened and can happen, perhaps, is through the polis. This is the Pnyx, picture of the Pnyx in, in Athens, which is the space in which democracy was cradled. It's a space of, space of appearance, of doxa, of opinion, of discourse, of debate, of making things appear, disappear, reliving them, continually resurfacing and never quite settling. So this is interesting because the very term polis, the Athenian city-state, is rested on a on polos, which is a swirl, a pole. So Heidegger does this etymological thing. And it's a, almost done. It's a it's a continuous going round in circle without ever settling. It's like the snake eating its tail continually. Polos and polis is a, a constant flickering of appearance and a disappearing of appearance. And this is arguably the cradle of democratic being, and it is in, in the Arendtian sense the human condition. Being amongst others is what not the animals have, neither the gods have, and therefore this capacity or the, the acceptance that to be truly is to not settle, but to continually re-enter, yeah, we start to play with this language a bit more, questioning and re-questioning is the authentic human condition, which is, I think, extremely intriguing and something that where we find something, we come out of the story and the limits of the two alternatives provided by Spencer Brown. It's not only about the old law, it's not only about laws made, but it's also about this living in the constant negotiation of what the boundary is. Oh, there's loads more I forgot to talk about the Zoe and Bios and, you know, good life and bear life, but we can maybe do it later. So, maybe... The questions arising from the little short story are primarily, is it better to draw fixed lines or to negotiate them and live with the negotiation of this? Is it better to be happy or to be free? Because he ends up with a state of unhappiness, but the unhappiness is a, a degree of freedom because it allows the continuous opening and closing of what is. Um, and, and what is the price to pay for this? Because the problem of the polis and the problem of this continuous flickering of presence and absence is that also it's quite debilitating. And there's time coming into it. It is not something that yields, as in the strategic sense, in my business line, yeah? we need solid foundations, decision, action. This is, this is very different. Anyway, I want to stop there. I, I just think that there are maybe links to be drawn here, and I'm, I'm very excited about it, thought about drawing it but I'm way too poor with the algebra but yeah there we are thank you thank you Fred thank you very much Mike
You managed to get through that whole, that whole talk about once mentioning Bruno Latour, which I found interesting. He's one of the people who picked up on Carl Schmidt and the reader and, and gone from the notion of land grab and yeah. territorialization. But another current in his work has always been the constant renewal of this, which in his work finds expression in his lament for the loss of forms of assembly, yeah. which he associates with the religious. Um, now that word is highly polluted and problematic, of course, and, and yeah. one reason people, people's cycles are raised. But does that not represent precisely the point of re-entering, uh, constant refreshing, and indeed rejoicing, as expressed in the tour? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't mention it's not it's not a go-to source for me, but Arendt would have a similar term of natality, and there's, there's loads more to it, of course. And she, she's written profusely about education as well, for example, and the importance of bringing the young into the old. And, and the world that is, that is education is preparing people for a world that is not yet made, that they are part of making. So natality underlies this, this whole idea. Democracy cannot be stale. It can't just be a reconfiguration of the old. It requires the continuous rejuvenation. So yeah, there's, there's loads more. Thank you. Thanks. And is, is there any online? Thanks, Mike. So, so do you think we're reaching a point uh, where we're realizing this limitation of democracy and are embracing that, that other alternative of, of how things develop and how things come into being? Thank you. Who am I, right? <laughs> but I think, I mean, look, watch the news. I think that the limits of democracy are becoming clearer. But I, I'm not sure whether we go in a Arendtian way as a way out, but I think the echo chambers of social media, of uh, increasingly algorithmically structured, smaller and smaller homophilic chambers of exchange are violating the idea of a democratic process. It, they're violating um, in two ways, because they, they foreclose the, the capacity for genuine exchange of opinion. Um, but they also curiously involved the political process itself, which happens on social media. So, so there's an increasing incapacity to react to these changes outside of these changes. And Bernard Stiegler has written about this in terms of the pharmacon, which is both a remedy but also a poison. And, and because the intermingling of, of political discourse in these echo chamber type things, algorithmically driven, you have short, truncated agonistic as opposed to dialogical. I think there's, it's, it's become increasingly difficult to move away and have what Arendt would have seen as a political discourse. Yeah, Rachel, you can go ahead. Um, so America especially is like really attached to the constitution for reasons I understand and support in some ways, but it seems like all the laws are just piling up upon one another and that something has to give because it's no longer relevant to the lives we live with the internet. So I was curious about how your system of politics um, might be applied to um, like a paradigm shift in how we do law in countries. I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. Would, would you mind for, for my benefit, just reformulating it very briefly. Would, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear or understand the question entirely. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so my question was like, it feels like very many laws now are irrelevant because of the changes in how we live today. And so I was curious about, I guess, um, seeing this like system of politics in action in terms of like a rapid change to a system? I'm, I'm not sure I've got an answer for this, but uh, the Spencer Brown story is quite provocative or evocative perhaps in that, because it is this, this play between this, this catching up of law and legal like, apparatuses and practices as opposed to something more foundational and maybe more settled and absolute. And, and you know, I don't... I'm not particularly sure I can answer, but I, I, reading the story is quite, it's quite neat because it, it sort of sets it up in a wonderful way. You know, the law, these, these, 
the capacity of the incapacity of the law to catch up as a problem and perhaps something more profound as a solution, but then it disrupts it as well. I'm not sure if I've answered, I'm sorry. Maybe we should take it offline, that one. Apologies. Yeah, I am very tired. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very clumsy. Sorry about that. I do have a bit of a messy question, I think, so I'm sorry. But uh, I was struck just by, by the correspondence in the talk there, uh, once you talk about Hobbes and the Leviathan. And uh, then you ended up with uh, Heidegger, the second uh, national socialist in the room, um, after um, uh, Karl Schmidt, of course, which is, a, and you talk about it in the context of Uncanny, which is very, um, I think. So, um, but to translate Uncanny, and I think that comes from Hölderlin, who translated as Ungeheuer, Ungeheuerlich. And Ungeheuer is, of course, the other word for monster. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have uh, translated it as, as, it as unheimlich, as Freud would do. Um, but uh, so that brought me just to another book uh, by Franz Neumann. Which is called Behemoth, mm -hmm. which is the other pair of the monsters in the in the sea, and um, this book uh, is really all about trying to make sense of what happened in the national socialist state. So, trying to unpack the the idea that there is absolute order, and there is a uh, the Führer is kind of structuring everything. And what he, his analysis shows is basically the opposite, that it's a record, a system of records of people fighting each other, the parties, the different BSR, BSS. So you have a state of confusion and uh, power dynamics inside the state. So yeah, that's rather a comment on the question. Dark topics. In dark times, right? A gambin we can throw in here? Yes, we can throw in a gambin. Yeah. I mean, there's no answer, but Schmidt hated pirates, hated them. He wrote a book to his daughter about seafaring, and that tells you a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, because it's, the, the, the sea is, is, it can't be sliced like the land. And, and so it's, I, I don't think Schmidt's someone we should enamor or Heidegger. I think they're bastards, right? But oh, it's the record isn't there, but they are. So, uh, <laughs> but it's good to not put people on the pedestal. So, so if you approach them with a degree of wariness, because they are ungeheuerlich. Yeah? They are themselves monstrous. So maybe there's a, yeah. but there's lots more to talk, of course. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.